you care about your TV, care how it performs, care how it sounds, care how it looks. If you do, then you absolutely need this benchmark disc from Spears and Munsell. Today, join me for an interview with the two brilliant gentlemen that made this disc possible. All right, guys, I am Brian. This is Tech Therapy. I am being joined by Spears and Munsell, Stacey Spears, Don Munsell. I am both humbled and honored to have the both of you here today. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thanks Thank for, having, you for us. having us. So uh, we had talked about doing this collaboration earlier in the year upon the release of your latest work, which we'll be discussing in today's video, but I thought it would be better to do this right before the Value Electronics King of TVs shootout, which will be their 19th, which is one of the most important tools that all the collaborators and judges will be seeing in that shootout. So I wanted to have this on before that shootout takes place as everyone will be seeing not just the demo material, but all of the deep dive slides, the skin tones, the star field, and again, the demo material, which you'll see on the TV behind me. So again, I want to thank you both also from all the creators that use your demo material since the first disc. And thank you for not copywriting us. <laughs> but many of our viewers have seen that footage, those star field, all of those tests and demos for many, many years and not really known the geniuses behind that disc. So I want to be able to bring you guys on again. Thank you so much for joining me. And we're sorry the geniuses couldn't join today, so you're stuck with Don and myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, what I always hear in our industry is the authority. Larger reviewers, we hear calibrators. And then when I meet you guys, I met Stacy a few years ago at one of the TV shootouts. These, in my opinion, you guys are the authority. I want to be able to really hear the science, the thought, the creativity behind what you guys know. And so rarely do we get a chance to have you guys on camera, but to have a yeah. disc like this that I only understand a portion of and use every day to have the creators on is unbelievable. And again, I'm humbled to have you. So if you guys want to tell me the creation of the disc, uh, the first disc, how many works you guys have together, whoever's free to start, let me know kind of the journey of putting out just this latest work. Let's start with that. Well, let me actually start with sort of the background on how we came together, and then we can go from there. So Excellent. I think it was 1999-ish, uh, Meridian had come out with a $20,000 DVD player, the 800, and they sent it to me to review. And at this point, I thought watching The Fifth Element and seeing how many bells had been lifted would have been a disservice. So uh, Tektronix had made what was called the VM700, which was sort of the state-of-the-art video analyzer at the time. Uh, the problem is it was $2,500 to rent for a week. And so I couldn't really, since we weren't really getting paid to write at the time, uh, spending $2,500 out of pocket to review this was, uh, was going to be tricky. So I came up with the idea and I talked to JJ, who was the editor of Secret and the owner of Secrets of Home Theater and High Fidelity. What if we get a bunch of DVD players together and, you know, sort of review the video quality of all of them using the same tests? And uh, he thought that was a good idea, but then I thought, well, if we're going to do video, we should also do some other categories, such as audio. And at the time, the audio precision was the sort of uh, equivalent of the VM700, but the audio side. Luckily, at Microsoft, the hardware team, which eventually became the Xbox team, happened to have one. And my roommate at the time worked on that team. He actually worked on the force feedback steering wheel. And oh, uh, so he was able to get the team to loan me the, the, the audio precision. And then I had another coworker at Microsoft who worked in usability. And so I had him put together a usability study for DVD remotes. And so he, you know, we got a bunch of us in, he came up with the actual test. We ran through it like you would do a normal usability study. And then I had someone else do uh, DVD audio. And then I think at the time, Brian and I sort of hacked together progressive scan. And that's sort of where Don will come in in a second. So we did the initial series of articles, the DVD benchmark. And then one day I get this email from Don uh, saying, hey, I, I saw these articles, you know, and he had some questions about progressive scan. And so I suggested we get together at the local Magnolia Hi-Fi. And we actually went in, sort of closed the door in their high-end theater. And we spent about an hour going through different discs, uh, talking to each other about it. And I remember at the end of that day, Don said, well, I think I'm going to write a tool that will just dump out the MPEG flags. And I thought, okay, sure. 
And a week later, he had that tool working. And so sort of, we sort of began from there. But I'll let Don come in now. And see what well, how many years ago was how many years ago was that, Stacy and Don? About 2000, I think, somewhere in that. Yeah, I 99, joined, 2000, somewhere. Yeah, in I there. joined Microsoft at the end of 99. And I think I met you shortly thereafter. And uh, yeah, we started looking at progressive scan and trying to figure out what exactly was that all about? Because in the early days, when they first started releasing progressive scan DVD players, the, the idea was that DVDs were inherently progressive scan and all you really had to do was just unlock the magic progressive scan images off the DVD. And we quickly determined that that wasn't true. Um, that some DVDs were encoded in a way that made it easier to present as progressive scan, but a lot of them were not in a variety of different ways. And that, you know, ultimately led to our first progressive scan article where we really dug into how are DVDs encoded? How do progressive scan DVD players uh, unlock the progressive, you know, image if, they, if it is encoded correctly, what do they do if it's not encoded correctly? Um, and what is the value of progressive scan over interlace in the first place? And that was really, you know, we went really, really in depth. And I remember thinking, this is way too technical. Like this is just, we got, you know, but Brian generated those amazing diagrams and we had all this stuff and it was really, it, 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 it got a lot of attention. People really liked this article. It was me and Brian and Stacy all collaborating on it. And, um, there were a bunch of people in the industry who said, wow, I never really understood our own products, you know, because like the engineers, you know, speak a different language and, um, a lot of people didn't really understand how DVDs were encoded. It's a kind of esoteric thing, but we wrote, we, we had the ability to write our own tools to actually, you know, dump information about exactly how the DVDs were encoded and what were the kinds of, of issues that would come up with specific DVDs and why were DVDs not all encoded to be progressive scape. Anyway, it was a really interesting uh, challenge in that, you know, and, and we did the progressive scan shootout and that just led to, it kind of snowballed from there. A few years later, I'm skipping over some things, but uh, we got asked by a company to do some um, test patterns and we were like, oh yeah, okay, sure. And it made perfect sense to us. We looked at what tools were available and for certain patterns, it just didn't make sense to use off the shelf tools. There, you know, there's some patterns that you really have to create in YCBCR natively. You can't, if you create them in RGB and then try to convert, it's inevitably going to make the pattern not work. It, it, you're going to compromise. And so we wanted to be able to create them directly in YCBCR. So we wrote our own pattern generating tools and those have expanded over the years. And, you know, at what? this point, we, you know, all of our stuff, all of these patterns and all of the process, not all of the processing software, but a lot of the software that processes even the, demo material and stuff like that. We wrote our own scaling software, we wrote our own video processing software. Um, because in, e in each case, we would try to use off the shelf stuff. It's not like we're against using off the shelf stuff, but sometimes we would find that it just didn't do what we wanted to do. So we would write it ourselves. So that's been, you know, the, the core of the collaboration is that we have the technical skill to write our own tools and our own software and to be able to create patterns in the native format if that's what's required anyway. so one of the uh one of the art of so our first two discs really focused on deinterlacing and inverse telecine but one of the encoders that was used out there in the field would actually toggle the progressive frame on and off with every frame and since we didn't have that encoder we actually wrote a tool that would do the toggling for us so we could take content encode it and then toggle the flag afterwards to simulate i think titanic was one of the ones that used that and uh uh, Monsters Inc. used that. So some big, big titles went through that encoder. The other thing, is, as Don mentioned, is it built relationships. So we had done a review of two different Panasonic players. I think it was the RP91, which used a Genesis chip, and then the RP56, which used a Ferrugia chip. And we sort of dogged on the RP91 and praised the RP56, and they were priced <laughs> the opposite directions. Oh, so the cheaper... And... Uh, the head of that program, Itani san actually reached out to us. And at first we thought he would be upset, but he was actually really happy because up until this point, uh, a company like Panasonic 
the product is built by Panasonic. They don't use anybody else's technology. So he was happy that we were actually able to report this and then he could talk about it because before that he couldn't. Interesting. So you guys became his outlet. Well, I'll tell you within the first however many minutes, nine minutes that we've been talking, <laughs> you've made me miss physical media terribly and you've made me miss <laughs> Panasonic terribly. Well, I think at this moment, I'd love to hear with all of this knowledge, what are your backgrounds? Um, Stacy, I'll start with you since you were the last one speaking. What are your backgrounds? What is your true profession that led to all the knowledge you guys are literally exhibiting organically back then? I'm talking about tools off the shelf. You're talking about creating patterns for a lot of the industry that didn't even exist at that time as far as even encoding it. But So we were both at Microsoft, so we both have sort of computer science degrees, so okay. software development. But um, I think it was 1994 when I met Joe Kane. Uh, there was a place in Southern California called Dave's Video, and they would do these industry days. So they'd bring in a movie director or producer to sign laser discs of whatever came out that week. Oh, laser discs. Well, they had one that was actually industry day. And so Joe Kane was there representing, I think, a video standard, which was his laser disc. I don't okay. think Video Essentials had come out yet. And so I met with him and I asked about, you know, attending an ISF class. And so they had done one. So I attended the, the second ISF class they had ever done. And that sort of got me in that direction. And then I started writing for Secrets of Home Theater. Uh, I, I have a background in computers. Um, I actually don't have a degree in computer science. I have a degree in theater, but you know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so he pretends, he, he's a good actor. Yeah, I, all I've been doing my whole life is pretending to be a software engineer and I'm just such a good actor that people buy it. It's <laughs> fantastic. You think it's you make it then realize you were making it the whole time. Yeah, that's right. I was a teenage well, hacker, so I've always just been like not like a black hat hacker or whatever, but you know, like I just I was a tinkerer. And so um, you know, my whole I, I've always been interested in technology and I've always been interested in movies and video. That's the thing that Stacey and I really the, the thing that we're most sympathetical on is we both love movies. And we do all this primarily to make movies better. We're like, if we can get if we can get manufacturers to make better products, if we can get people to encode better discs, if we can get people to care about these quality issues that we bring up, it makes movies better. Like that's the big payoff, honestly. I mean, the money's not terrible, but like neither of us are making a I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I should say that we're not making a living making the Spears and Munsell disc. You know, we have other jobs. It's that Spears and Munsell discs, you know, are it's passion, successful. Yeah. But it's a passion project. It's a passion. Like we do this because we love it and because we're interested in it. So, you know, as part of doing these various test patterns, we did, a, you know, various deep dives into color theory and video standards and how video is encoded, which is really interesting. I mean, Charles Poynton is the world's expert on video standards and also an incredible expert on color theory and his book is like a primer on color theory and it has just been fascinating to dig into that and figure out how we perceive color why why are there certain things that you notice on tv there's a bunch of things that i didn't understand that i would see in um blu-rays and dvds that i just didn't get until i started to understand how color works and how color theory works well, Don uh, left out one of the most important parts. That's if you've ever played Leisure Suit Larry. Oh, you've, yeah. You've, uh... <laughs> I, I was the assistant designer of Leisure Suit Larry 7. That's probably the most thing I'm, you know, the thing that sold the most copies that I worked on. Well, except Windows. We both worked on Windows. That sold like a billion copies, but, you know. Oh, my gosh. But, well, so anyway. you guys had said current jobs. What are your current jobs right now? What are you doing right at this moment? Uh, I run a website about Disney discounts that my sister started. And uh, Stacy, I work for Red Digital Cinema, so I'll do firm, camera firmware and software on the on the uh, playback side as well. So, Amazing. so eclectic, I would say, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, like, I've started off like you know reviewing TVs, and I've worked my way backwards up to now actually creating cameras that are movies are shot on. So, I've tried to do every every part in the chain well that's the part that i think is fascinating getting back to the disc when did the disc become something that would help tv manufacturers because as you mentioned um having them make their products better it's amazing how we've gone through tvs for the last number of years and seeing them fail certain patterns where so, did you guys correlate dvd to the tv it well, sounds like it was a lot of dvds initially now it's connected to the tv industry so um 
Oppo Digital reached out to us around 2006 or 2007 saying, miss hey. Them. Miss them too. <laughs> yeah. They're like, hey, we want you to build a disk that, okay. you know, people can use for testing. And they're like, don't worry if it breaks our player, we'll fix it. And in fact, before the first disk shipped, uh, they were developing their first Blu-ray player. And it had some issues that I'm like, I don't know how they're going to fix this. And a firmware update later it was fixed before the player even shipped. So, oh, and just okay. to give you an idea, that's how Oppo worked. There was another company that came to us and said, we want you to build a disc that makes us look good and everyone else look bad, <laughs> which is actually much harder to do. Yeah. Okay. So Don and I had joked about putting hidden patterns on there. One where the pattern's all distorted and one where it's correct. So you're at a show, you could put on the distorted one and say, look how bad this player is. We wow. never actually did that, of course. No, no. We also talked about putting a running commentary, like, so this pattern, it looks cool. It's got perceived value, but it doesn't do anything. <laughs> we never did that either. <laughs> no. Yeah, every once in a while we'll we'll come up with a pattern that, you know, we're like, oh, we're not exactly sure what this will do, but it looks so cool. We should just put it on there. People would like it, you know, but but no, we where have are the not. pattern I'm just done. I'm not... Where do they come from the pattern? So when you are you guys literally sitting there with a reference monitor and just seeing what breaks what when you come up with these patterns? How do you organize them? I think the cre the creation of the disc Again, I have four here on the newest edition. There was two on the earlier. There's so much more material on this disc that I think even if you have the last edition, you definitely need this edition. But organizing all of those patterns, are you guys in a room together? Are you guys just breaking all the TVs we love? What's, what's well, the methodology? So a lot of times someone will find an artifact watching a movie and we'll start time. looking at the pixels to understand what the artifact is. And we'll try to create a pattern that amplifies the artifact to show it off. Okay. Other patterns are based on industry Saturn, industry standards, or others are alternate versions of industry standards, like the a color bars. Times, oh, good. Sorry. Uh, a lot of times, I mean, almost all patterns were generated to highlight a specific flaw that people have seen in actual content, even going all the way back to the early days of Sympathy or whatever. When people would spot problems or they'd see problems, they'd say, well, okay, What's the easiest way to make sure that people can see this problem so they can adjust it away or get rid of it or calibrate or do whatever is necessary? The color bars, all patterns were generated because of some problem that was actually happening in content. So most of the patterns ultimately come out of either one of us or somebody we know or somebody sometimes occasionally it's been like somebody has emailed us and said, hey, on this disk, there's this one thing and we'll go get the disk, look at it, see what they're talking about and then try to figure out what's going on. And in a lot of cases, obviously, when people bring something to our attention, we look at it and we go, oh yeah, we know what that is. That's something we already have a pattern for. But every once in a while, somebody will point something out, either a friend of ours or sometimes a manufacturer. Sometimes, you know, you, you just some from somewhere, somebody will say, look at this thing. I don't know what this is and I don't know what's happening. Sometimes that, a YouTube influencer. Yeah. Sometimes it's an influencer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We'll say, I'm seeing this thing and I don't know what's yeah. going on. And of yeah. course, if we don't know what's going on, that immediately, for both of us, that's very exciting. We're like, oh, hey, something new we have not seen, you know, because it's, it's getting harder and harder to see artifacts we have not encountered before. But when we do see that, that's really interesting. In some cases, it just comes down to like, there's a bug, you know, like the all all TVs now are basically like computers, you know, they, they're running on software, pretty elaborate software. And so there can be bugs, you know, or just like somebody fat fingered a coefficient in a, you know, conversion matrix, and now all the reds are too bright or whatever, you know, like, literally, that happens, you know, it, you can, people will ship a TV, where they just transpose two digits in a number when they were typing in some code. And now all the, you know, it doesn't measure correctly. Like that really actually happens. It's hard to believe. And yet. That uh, explains a ton, by the way, Don. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I remember something happened while we were working at Microsoft, a particular company whose names we will not mention. Um, they sent us a piece of, a piece of code that had the wrong color transfer matrix. It was close enough that the colors looked basically okay, but they weren't right. And it was, they weren't right to the eye. So we did some measurements and we figured out this, this was when Stacy and I were working in the video group at Microsoft and we did some measurements and we tested it and we said, Oh, this is off. And we sent them an email saying, Hey, you know, your, your latest code is off. 
um, how did this make it through your testing? And they said, well, don't tell anybody, but we don't test it oh. because, because you do. <laughs> So, you know, like Microsoft tests it, why should we test it when you're going to test it? And it's like, then this is a large multi-million dollar company that you would recognize. And they were like, I don't know, you know, like, why should we test it if somebody else is going to do it? And we're like, at one point, we had a Panasonic uh, television. This is the early days of Progressive Scan DVD. And they we had Panasonic television and a Panasonic DVD player. And when you put the DVD player in progressive mode, the television locked out a bunch of aspect ratio adjustments. It, it went from like five different aspect ratio modes to two, and they weren't the right two that you oh, would want, right? Like zoomed it was, in. <laughs> it was weird. And at some point, we were talking to a Panasonic rep, and I said, how is it that your television and your DVD player don't work right together? And he's like, well, those guys are in two different buildings. That's very much like Sony and Sony PlayStation. <laughs> and I, and we've like, had those conversations. Well, I, it's the same model year. It's the it's your yeah. two product. I mean, ah. Anyway. So during the development of Xbox One, uh, originally, management wanted to get fifty of the exact same TVs for everyone to use, and I had okay. to fight saying, "No, no, we need to get every make and model we can find," and that turned out to be a good thing because we found a bunch of 1080p TVs where the EDID reported it preferred 720p, and yes. had had we not done this and allowed you to override it those TVs would have played back the Xbox at 720p on a 1080p TV. So. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, it only did 900p half the time anyway. So unfortunately. <laughs> well, games are often <laughs> scaled up, but yeah. that's a different But being a, being a yeah. gamer, I'm so used to things being fixed via firmware updates. But to talk to you guys that are actually the ones they check with, and so much uh, we've seen in TVs now at the higher end, the processing really becomes what's so important. And having this disc, even on the surface level, being able to push Dolby Vision, HDR 10 plus, being able to change on the fly from 1000 nits to 4000 nits to 10,000 nits. We've seen that only certain TVs would bother mastering past a certain. So being able to bring those results to them and having you guys talk about that with specificity is, is a gift for me because like you guys reviewing things now in the early 2000s it's pretty much what we do surface based with tv reviews and that's why when we talk about the authority who is and a lot of times calibrators and i know stacy with isf we, we can talk about that as well is i know a lot of the calibrators we know jason dustel is a good friend and a lot of what they do i respect but when i talk to guys like you the science behind it is really what shows up in this disc now, do you want this to be a calibration disc, a tool? What is it really described as? I call it both. What do you guys describe this? So tool we specifically we specifically call it a benchmark, named after the original DVD benchmark. But calibration okay. is just one tiny aspect. I call it yes. a Swiss Army knife. Yeah. You know? <laughs> okay. Like, can you elaborate? Well, it's supposed to be. It's supposed to have all the tools that we can think of. Like if if we were really trying to monetize this, I don't know, optimally or something, we would make like a consumer disc and a like enthusiast disc and a like professional disc, yep. which is something that some other disc vendors have tried to do. Well, but it's to, such give an, to give you an example, a lot of the patterns are on there are designed for display manufacturers or CE companies. So mm -hmm. we would sell 10 copies and we probably have to charge a hundred thousand dollar per copy to recoup the costs, which would be yeah. worth it for them. I mean, right. some of these, we, we have been told by CE companies that like there are patterns that we have generated that, you know, they would have paid a lot of money for, but you know, like it's, that's a weird market, you know, trying to sell, it's like trying to sell consulting services. You know, like if you can do it and you can get Samsung or LG or whatever to pay you a hundred thousand dollars to like come in and do quality analysis and stuff, that's great. But honestly, we'd rather just make a disc that has got stuff for CE manufacturers, stuff for calibrators, stuff for consumers. There's a lot of stuff on the disc. And it's the disc that we would want. Ultimately, like Stacy and I are enthusiasts and professionals, and we, we, we wear a lot of hats. And we want to we wanna make a disc that has enough in there for people to explore. Like nothing's missing. There's nothing left out. We didn't. You know, there's nothing that we could think of that isn't on there. Right? Right. We, we wanted the disc that would have been useful when we did the original DVD benchmark. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Time. We yeah. want the disc that we would have liked to have bought. 
Yeah. We wish somebody else had made it, and then we could have saved hours and hours <laughs> to work. So Boundary. now there are two 4K discs, and so the original plan was <laughs> the first disc was only going to be for the press, and it yeah. was gonna is going to be a small section of patterns just for the press, and then a year later we would do the full blown disc for everyone. The problem is that that uh, disc for the press came out about two years late. And we ended up putting more content on so it would appeal to more people, but it had no directions. And because of that, it upset a lot of people. But we made this assumption that anybody who had the second edition disc, a lot of the patterns were the same, just in 4K and HDR. So they would understand it, but that turned out not to be the case. Apparently, once you put it in the new disc, if the instructions aren't there, you forget everything about the old disc. And so we learned that lesson the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> it is very hard to make a disc that has patterns of such wide applicability you know some of them you really have to have expensive test equipment in order to really use it i mean you can obviously you can put it up on the screen you can we hope that people will come up with new uses for it you know like some of these patterns we've made them as precise as possible some people are going to be make use of them using video analyzers some people will find other uses for them that's all fine you know like each one was designed for a specific purpose but uh it's all in there i mean you know it's got and it's hard to design it in such a way that someone who's brand new to video calibration or, or for all of this can make use of it. And so with this disc, we really tried to be careful to say, OK, it's kind of working its way up in complexity as you work your way down the menus. Right at the top, we've got basic patterns for doing basic adjustments and checking for basic problems. And that's that that would be sort of the consumer disk. That video yeah. setup menu really is the consumer disk that right. you can do you can use without any test equipment. The and problem is not a lot of people would want to pay 20 bucks just for those, you know, dozen patterns. Right. I would. I have. But, yeah. <laughs> but that's why we have, you know, basically the pattern targets four or five different markets. And yeah. so if you're a beginner, you might get mad because there's not enough details on the advanced patterns, but gotcha. those also weren't really targeted at the beginner. So. Yeah. And, you know, there's stuff in the second section that an enthusiast can use. Um, if you start to get a little bit of test equipment with a simple light meter, you can do a bunch of things using a variety of tests on, on our disk. And I mean, you can buy a decent enough light meter on, um, on Amazon, you know, like that you can do something useful, like the kind of equipment that a calibrator would use. That's very expensive equipment, but you can get something that you can use. Um, you know, Don had mentioned people coming up with different uses for the patterns. So we tried to develop a pattern to show off that sort of flashing them when you come out of black on an OLED. Mm -hmm. um, and that's on the second disc, the montage disc. It's the one that sort of flashes colors on, then they pan side to side. The problem is it didn't actually show the artifact. We weren't going to include it, but Vincent had actually found another use for it, okay. uh, which shows some of the trailing and stuff that happened on like QD OLED. So we put it on there. So it doesn't do our original purpose, but it had a new purpose. Which stress yeah. broke something else. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now, you guys had mentioned HDR, talk about Dolby Vision. Is that the biggest advance you guys have seen? We've talked a lot about DVD to Blu-ray. Have you been impressed? Um, the so, biggest uh, advance is 3D, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so so like, I'm, I'm a 3D hardcore guy, so I'm still mad that they took 3D well, out HDR of HDR is 3D is, is 3D without the glasses. Oh, oh, oh here we go. Nice. This is where I want it to go. <laughs> no, so I mean, for me personally, ahead. I think HDR is probably the biggest advancement we've had since HD and then since color. Uh, but now one thing I want to point out, we obviously have the demo material in all these different HDR formats. But when you actually make HDR content, you don't grade for Dolby Vision. You don't grade for HLG. You grade HDR. And then all okay. these formats are really just delivery systems. Mm. And so we took the same piece of content and we just put it through all the different delivery systems available on Blu-ray. or 4K. When I say Blu-ray, I mean 4K Blu-ray. Yeah, yeah, this is, as far as we know, the only significant content that has been that this has been done to where we had one master and we really try to do the very best rendition possible and when i say we i'm stacy that's really stacy's baby um but he he ran it through all of these different formats and tried to do the very best version we weren't sandbagging one or the other we weren't trying to uh, make it look bad in one format and better in another format it's really just saying making the best use possible with this very intentionally difficult content you know the content goes all the way up to 10,000 nits in places you know by design 
Um, not all of it is goes up to 10,000 nits. You know, there's stuff that's very moderate in HDR range. There's there's stuff that's sort of mid mid range, stuff that goes really really high range. Right. So I had three goals when shooting the content: one, to shoot and finish in 8K; two, to go all the way up to 10,000; and three, to go all the way out to 2020. So. Yeah, it's so very high dynamic range. It's very high color gamut. And it's designed to test the limits of each of these formats and to test the limits of, of display technology. The idea is that it should be usable for years and years as displays get better and better. You should start to see more and more in this content. Well, and that's what I'm, I am a LED, LED fan at heart. And I was one that was waiting for 4,000 nits, waiting. Some of the TVs had gotten close. And then we'd seen streaming kind of cap, I believe, at 1,000 nits, a lot of the different. Um, when you're shooting that material, Stacey, are you shooting it? Or who designs the demo material, the way it's being shot? What's it being shot with? A little bit of detail in that demo so, material. Music's great, by the way, in the last disc. <laughs> so um, basically, I was one of six people in the world that has that had the VistaVision Dragon camera from Red. They had only oh, made a handful just because of the difficulty of making the sensor back then. Okay. And so I had uh, worked with a company, Clark Dunbar, and I said, here, I'll make you a deal. I will let you borrow the camera and shoot whatever you want on it because he does a lot of uh, stock footage in okay. exchange that I get rights to everything you shoot. Okay. And so that's how that, because uh, I had actually rented it out to IMAX for a movie at, I think, 10000 for the week. So again, having very few of these, uh, there was a premium in the beginning. So basically he went out and he actually borrowed it for six months. So that's a lot of money I could have made if I wanted to rent it out, but instead I just had the rights to all the footage. And so, so that you was possibly have a picture of that camera that you can send to me that I can add to this video. Sure. Excellent. And it's just the, the previous red camera, but mine's also okay. in a special forged carbon fiber. Oh. So woven carbon fiber is the normal. I had one that's in forged carbon fiber, which is actually Brad Pitt's idea. He, it was his idea to do forged. But then I have one of two LCDs that are in forged. So Red only made two, myself and the CEO wow. at the time. Amazing. But anyway, so that was the first 8K camera from Red. And then they eventually came out with the uh, VistaVision um, Monstro. And that sensor was much easier to produce. So I would say of the 77 shots, 80, 90% are VistaVision Dragon, and the other 10% are VistaVision Monstro. And I, and I actually have a spreadsheet that calls out which one's which. And there's a the few shots that you shot yourself, right? I mean, the previous yeah. montage is mostly your, yeah. you, you went out and shot with right. it. And this one has more of So a four shots are myself. That's the three Seattle shots and the Tulip. So I did that with Tyler Pruitt. Uh, the LA skyline aerial footage is uh, Phil Holland and the rest is Clark Dunbar. So all of it was shot on my camera, except for Phil's shot. That was his VistaVision dragon. He was one of the other six that had the camera. Amazing. Well, I had met Phil and I think we're seeing yeah. him again at the shootout. And I had met Tyler last time I met you, Stacy. Well, it's interesting though, is we know all of us that use the, uh, the benchmark disc know that by heart every single shot. And then what's interesting is last year, I think we had an early copy of it, at the right. value electronic shootout, and we all noticed a squirrel. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> then we noticed saw a purple flower and everybody froze and it was being filmed on a Z2, a $30,000 TV and an A95K. So we've waited an entire year to see this new footage. It is spectacular. And um, I love the music. And again, being able to stress test it on the fly and see where it clips. And as you've mentioned, HDR 10 at Dolby Vision, uh, at 10,000 nits, as far as I know, there isn't any 10,000 nit content that we can show. So, and also for us testing TVs to really be able to push these newer brands that are trying to rise to the top and see where they fall in terms of processing. Um, I think they can use that information. Do those manufacturers reach out to you guys as well as far as TVs, the way Oppo and Panasonic did back in the day? So LG has, and so for example, Samsung provided the HDR10 Plus team at Samsung provided the tools to do HDR10 Plus. So Excellent. they've been using the montages for their 10 Plus demos. Uh, the QD OLED team at Samsung, Samsung Display, yeah, has no been them. using the footage. Yeah. Uh, so Sharik, yeah. So um, yeah, he's awesome. So going to back to the music for a second. So Chris Steering had introduced me to a guy named Mark Fishman who does a lot of Atmos mixing for a lot of TV shows and movies. And so he had helped create the new uh, Atmos test tones on the disc. And so I asked him if he knew anybody who can compose music. At the time, he was working on Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. 
And okay. so two friends on that show actually composed the music for me. One of them happens to be Randy Newman's cousin. Oh, nice. Yeah. A lot of composers in that family. <laughs> so, and, and how long, I know the disc took a long There's time. There's the squirrel behind you. Is it, <laughs> how long does that collaboration take? I know we waited a long time for the disc. Um, the, diff, the time between both discs, how long would you say it took to release these two? Or how long does it take to get all these people together? Well, it was four years to do this last disc. Part of it was authoring. David had a lot of trouble with the authoring software. Okay. And I think he ended up, disc one is about six different discs authored and squished together. Because the authoring software could get to a point and couldn't do any more. So he had then spin up a new disc, new disc, new disc, and then merge them all together and you know, cross our fingers. Have we, have, if we were to redo it today, we would have actually authored each menu section as its own disc just because of the limitations of the software. But the music was done pretty quickly. Uh, I gave them the final edit. And then I think over a couple of weeks, they composed the music in two pieces because it's such a long montage. So the first half I thought was very majestic. And then the second half was more electronic. And I actually sent them several samples of music I liked. And then they sort of used that as a guide. Well, and for then, us, it's, it's very helpful to have the music because we are sitting here hours and hours of filming. And when you kind of tap in your foot, you know you're in a good place. <laughs> well, the music can take you out of the video as well, right? It, takes, it turns off the critical eye because you just sort of get into it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But um, uh, if you have you watched the graded versus ungraded montage? I have. I've seen, yeah, I've seen just about everything. Real quick, you want to go back to Flesh Tones. You mentioned something about skin a story. Tones. Oh, skin yeah, so, Tones. I apologize. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Flesh Tones would be a different industry. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bring them on, too, if you like. So, um, well, we did work with them for HDVD at Microsoft. And so a few of us had to sign release forms. And I remember I miss to just... HDVD, too. You guys are killing me today. I yeah. loved HDVD, but go ahead. So uh, recently, Chris Deering was evaluating some, uh, I guess, a new tone mapping algorithm in the JVC projector. And he's looking at it and he got used to it. And then he went to the Lumagen. He's like, oh my God, something's wrong because the, the skin tone content looked dramatically different. And basically on the JVC, that white background is just a flat white background. But on the Lumagen, it's a gradient. That's because it's a gradient. Oh. oh it's, a, it's a um, cyclorama. It's sort of the stage that curves up. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Phil actually shot that, all the skin tone footage. Yep. And so he put a light at the base of it shining up the wall so to produce a gradient. But on the JVC, there was no gradient. It's literally a flat white background. Wow. Now, are you, what do you guys personally use at home? Are you guys TV guys? Are you projectors? Don, you'd mentioned 3D to me, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on 3D. And was it a projector? <laughs> I thing? would not want to hear it? his yes. thoughts. On <laughs> <laughs> Should we do a separate video for 3D? Yeah, Stacy, you go get a sandwich, and I'll just tell him <laughs> what I think about 3D. So, um, I recently tore out my theater because I converted it back to a garage, mostly to sell my place. So okay. it'll be 2025, 2026 before I build my new theater. I'm already designing it now. So part mm -hmm. of the, the home I bought has two bedrooms back to back with two walk-in closets. Well, those are all being ripped out, converted into a theater and, a, and an office. You have to have your priorities, Stacey. Exactly. You don't need to hang your clothes anywhere. Just fold them. <laughs> well, this, what this is a spare room. It's five bedrooms that will be taken down to... Like no. one, one will be an arcade room with all the arcade one-up classics. One will be the theater, you know, oh, a excellent. guest bedroom, a master bedroom. Uh, the garage is a four-car tandem garage where the back half is going to be converted into a gym. So, you, you know, know, all planned out. But to your wow. point, as I had a projector, a DLP projector, okay. but going forward in the new theater, it will be uh, a flat panel. So, like, if I were to buy today, it would probably be an LG OLED, but we'll okay. see what's available in 2026. Yeah, I was using projectors for a long time. Um, I have a lot of projectors. And um fairly small room 106 inch screen sitting far too close according to the standards but i just like that sort of imax experience you know so i just I. that's how i loved it but hdr finally convinced me like it, projectors really can't at this point you know at least off the shelf projectors that aren't you know pro style projectors cannot do hdr very effectively so I finally switched to LG OLED. Also, the LG OLED, the the one with the uh, polarized, you know, uh, alternating line polarizers, had the best 3D. So for a long time, I was using the last model of LG OLED that had the 3D polarizers. The C6. 
<laughs> yeah, the C6. Wow. So that was the 2016 model. And eventually I got tired of, you know, there's there's some artifacts in that, especially in the light stuff. And I finally got tired of it. So that's in the garage now. And I have no I have no setup system right now for 3D. I mean, I actually have half a dozen different systems that can do 3D. I go to I was just yesterday I was at my 3D camera club and we were projecting 3D um, using dual projectors, you know, and polarizers and stuff, but I don't really keep that set up all the time. So most of my viewing right now is on a last year model uh, LG 77 G2, G2, I think, G3, yeah. G2, 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 yeah. yeah. G2. G2, 77 inch G2. And uh, man, that has a beautiful picture. Um, I think Sony's OLEDs are also really great, but um, but I, you know, LG I think has a good price point and I, and we know the LG guys, or we we knew the LG guys. That yeah. whole that whole division has been shaken up in various ways, but they do make a good product. Well, 3D with projection, I noticed even cheaper pro projectors did pretty decent 3D that I yeah, enjoyed absolutely. much more yeah. than TVs. With I know with TVs, it was crosstalk was a big problem. Right. Um, but once I saw it on a projector, even at home on a five hundred dollar projector, I was very impressed with it. I hope it does make a comeback. Um, at some point, especially since TVs are larger, I said about six feet gaming from an 83 inch, uh, mm -hmm. C one, uh, this right. TV is being replaced by a hundred inch within the next, you know, hopefully, you know, few weeks wow. in this little studio, but, um, projectors have always interested me a great deal, but those black levels throw me off in the theater now. Cause they don't, they don't let the theater get very dark. I think because sure. of safety. <laughs> But no, well, today, you, the only way you can buy a brand new 3D display, uh, there's a few of them being made in China. And I know some people because I'm in, heavily involved in the 3D community. I know some people actually import Chinese flat panel uh, TVs and f you have to learn how to operate the menus. They're not in English. And, you know, like there's people, there's, there's enthusiasts out there, you know, essentially creating their own instruction manuals that are like these characters mean, you know, brightness and these characters mean, you know, um, so you can do that, but projectors right now, you can buy a brand new projector that you can just hook up buy some DLP link glasses and view 3d yeah. and plug in a 3d Blu-ray player, which many three Blu-ray players are still 3d capable. It's not, complicated from to leave in that circuitry and Even we have the 3d th test disc with 3d test patterns yeah we are the only people who've ever made a 3d well, there was this, there was another one but it was wasn't the same yeah. yeah um yeah well our 3d test disc is actually good but um anyway <laughs> well we created patterns like to measure the delay between the left and right eye yeah yeah well and things like that so while we're talking about that um I know it's near and dear to my heart, obviously all three of us is physical media um, and that mm. it's now become streaming only. You guys touch on what your thoughts are. I know we're getting away from the disc and we'll return to it. Definitely purchase the disc, but I love that it's- Streaming more, is convenient. <laughs> it's convenient and I feel like- um, But the quality is not consistent. And uh, uh, yes. Especially when you if you're in the, the middle of watching a movie and all of a sudden it pauses or the quality changes. So something I pointed out before is it's really difficult to actually compare TV streaming. So if you've got two TVs side by side, they're actually fighting over the bandwidth. And even though you're both watching Netflix, they might not be watching the same encode. Yeah. Well, and then when the two of you were talking about Don and Stacy both saying checking for artifacting, and that's nearly impossible with anything streaming. There's so many different things in the chain that create artifacting from your Wi-Fi or right. whatever. But are you guys? Where are you guys with uh, not only the quality of streaming, but also with 8K? Uh, you, you know, the the disc is shot with 8K cameras. Is 8K not succeeding? I know I'm all over the place, but I have you guys here. I have to ask, is 8K not succeeding because there isn't a format promised? Or what are your thoughts on that? So when it comes to image acquisition, you obviously want to capture the highest quality so that you have the, the source material there. But, you know, it's like anything. You One, there's no, there's no format. So that's a biggie. The other is... Um, visual effects to do it even 4k is very expensive and that industry is you know a race to the bottom so and, they want to spend most, those... most professional formats that people actually record in they record it kind of double the resolution of what the eventual final 
format is going to be that's that's kind of been a rule of thumb i think in the industry for a long time like audio engineers will often record stuff originally their original stems when they're uh working on 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 stuff you know maybe recorded at say 9600 hertz or something like that 900 samples per second basically because if they're going to manipulate it you know they want as much resolution as possible so that eventually when they finally do the final mix down to 44k or 48k or whatever the delivery format is going to be they feel like they're not going to get audible artifacts and so shooting at 8k for something that's eventually going to be 4k it's the same kind of thing you want the cleanest sort of plate you can you want the cleanest master you can so that you have enough room to like you can crop if you have to you can you know rearrange you can process you can do all these things and then when you finally mix it down to the final 4k it's going to look pretty good so and the word that don used plates so vfx will shoot 8k plates but like guardians of the galaxy 2 was shot on the same camera that the montage was shot on and guardians of the galaxy 3 was shot on red's latest camera so mm -hmm. all 8k and now that you know the cameras do 8k 120 which has been very popular especially for I mean, sports in in fact, plenty of stuff is being shot at 4K and then eventually mastered at 4K. And of course, you know, there's some compromises in that, you know, but um, it's not that that's uh, impossible. But this is one of the things that really makes it tricky is that 4K is already kind of overkill for the kind of sizes of displays that people are mostly watching TV on. Like, if you do a side by side comparison of 4K versus 2K, a lot of people will not be able to tell the difference. You know, I remember showing people when Blu-ray finally came out, or it might have been HD DVD, but I was showing people, no, actually, I remember I was showing them, uh, what was the HD VHS format? It was DVHS. DVHS. Yeah, DVHS. Yeah. I had a DVHS copy yeah, of The yeah. Mummy, and I also had a DVD of The Mummy, and I was like, oh my God, look at how much better this looks. And I had my friends over, and this is on 106-inch HD, you know, projector so plenty of room to see all the detail and to me it was like night and day you look at the mummy and everybody's hair is just kind of this like vague mass and then in the hd you can start to see strands and stuff and i showed them the dvd and then i showed them the hd and of course all the colors look basically the same you know similar anyway um the light levels were the same it's the same basic master it's just one you're getting the hd and the other it's been mixed down to 480p and to me, it was like night and day, but they're like, okay, is this, this is a different thing? Yeah. And <laughs> doesn't that always thing? hurt? So that I hurts. had the same issue when The Hobbit came out. I took my team to go see The Hobbit in a high frame rate. Oh, was, 60th, was it 60 or 140? 48. 48. 40, oh, 40. Okay. And my, yeah. my coworker, she kept nudging me going, do you see a difference? I don't see a difference. And I'm like, how can you not see that motion? Oh God, it's terrible. Yeah. I thought people were leaving that theater nause nauseous when that movie came out. That was kind of. It just looked like, a, well, I, I thought that shooting native high frame rate would look better than like the TV's conversion, but no, yeah. it looked the same. So that just shows how impressive the algorithms were. Well, for yeah. HD, for HDR too, guys, as I remember when HDR was first kind of announced, it was almost sold as a dynamic contrast in, in the stores looking at it as it was going to be brighter. It was going to be sharper, cleaner. And then once we saw it on TVs, it in many ways was dim or and then chasing Dolby Vision. Have you well, guys seen that so rectified or one changed? of the things well, that happens? Uh, I mean, one of the things with HDR, it's tough when you're just watching HDR content. It looks good, right? But people are used to HD and 4K looking good and they don't realize how much better it looks because it's a similar sort of thing. Like people if you're not steeped in video, like evaluating how content is looking relative to something you vaguely remember, it's just really hard. If you have side by side the same movie, this one's HDR and this one is just regular SDR, it's it, anybody can see the difference. Like you, it's just obvious. You're like, oh my god, there's so much more there. There's more contrast. Like stuff that's washed out in one has actual detail and and smoothness in the other. Like it's radically different. But just seeing it, it's not that impressive to people because reality is very HDR, it turns out. Yeah. And TV well, has always been a little bit less compelling than reality. HDR is getting closer, but it's still, you know, people just look at it and go, yeah, it looks really good. But my recollection is that, you know, HD looked good. DVD looked good. People yeah. thought VHS looked so, pretty good when it was brand new. You know what I mean? Like people yeah. are well, very forgiving of 
when they first talked about HDR, they said, oh, it's 10,000 nits. People freaked out because they thought they're going to get 10,000 all the time. Then when it comes out, the the specular highlights are brighter and they're like, well, it's not bright at all, which goes back to your dim comment. Yeah. Hold on the noise out there. Um, But if you take HD resolution HDR and you put it side by side with SDR 4K, the HDR is going to look sharper Mm. because of that improved contrast, that intra contrast. Yeah. Yeah. So what's interesting about that is that I think the same me using the Mummy Blu-ray, and I think for many of us within the TVs and even doing 4K Blu-ray reviews, some people actually preferred the SDR as it seemed like it was a brighter image all around. Because our TV in- was probably at 300 nits in torch yeah. mode, so it was a lot brighter. <laughs> yeah. So some of the early HDR displays, and Amazon had this requirement, that in HDR mode, they couldn't alter the brightness. So you would see... Oh yeah, just maxes. It would be it would be at the authoring limits, but when you switch to SDR, then the TV can go into its high contrast mode or whatever, and you get 300 nits. So it'd be a lot brighter in SDR, yeah. and that was actually a problem for for Amazon. Wow. Yeah. The problem, the... Go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, so they eventually relaxed that requirement so okay. that people could bump up HDR. But okay, I have a friend who just he bought a he has a a Sony TV that was SDR when it came out, they put a firmware update that made it HDR, but it was capable of 300 nits in a 10% window. So he complains about HDR and I'm like, that is an SDR TV. Stop (laughs) complaining. And I remember Samsung also had, I think that that the first couple one connect boxes, you could actually update them probably the same way. But I, we see also I'm a big gamer, a big PC gamer. And this goes back to what you were saying too, Don about 3d HDR, and this may also go to the film industry, HDR seemed like it was tacked on. And I know in gaming, what we have is a lot of elevated blacks, which unfortunately Mm. in our LG old LEDs, especially the banding is out of control because Mm. we're out of. So I feel like in 3D, Don, I know you being a fan of it, I think true 3D is amazing, but Mm, they tacked it on to everything. Yeah. And someone once told me the filmmakers with hdr were told they had to start putting in hdr so they just took the camera and shot at the sun and said there's your hdr are you guys seeing better implementation i know it's in gaming it's still struggling but are you seeing and i know it's mostly streaming from what the content you guys personally watch are you seeing it get to where you expected it or is it lagging well i I, think it's it's going to become the standard i mean like almost all 4K displays that you see today are HDR enabled. So people are masking more and more content in HDR. And because it doesn't require any special glasses or anything, it's just going to become the standard. Everything's going to be HDR. Whether people really perceive it as a huge benefit or not, it's coming, it's happening, it'll get better and better and better. I I, I don't have any qualms about HDR. HDR it's just going to be another tool in the filmmaker's arsenal and there will be people who will use it really effectively. And then there's going to be content where you're going to be like, are we really getting a whole lot out of this? But over time, as they can really count on, everybody's going to see this in HDR. You're going to see people sort of using it more and more effectively. So HDR is going to be great. 3D, the problem was that for some people, 3D was a was a net negative and they weren't thrilled with it. And the fact that you wear glasses really actually bothered some people variety of things like that like i think reality is 3d right like that's my basic argument is that like as you look around your room you're viewing in 3d and parallel you know with parallax and everything and hdr i'm sorry and (laughs) hdr yes reality is hdr so you kind of figure 3d is never going to go away completely it's been going in ebbs and flows for the history of photography you know the three the stereoscope you know, the stereoscope, like you've seen stereoscopes, right? Yep. Where like the old fashioned ones with the cards and everything where you look into yep. it and, you know, the stereoscope was invented before photography. Like it was invented to ship for scientists to show like binocular vision and they had drawings, you know, that you could view in 3D. So the first stereoscopic photograph was less than a year after the first photograph. So 3D photography and 3D filmmaking have been with us forever. It's just as a commercial thing, it's kind of gone up and down and up and down. When Avatar 2 came out, something like 70, 75% of the people that saw Avatar 2 saw it in 3D, which is not true of, say, every time Pixar releases a a movie, they generally release a 3D version of it. But only now 15% or 20% of people will see it in 3D. 
which is funny because those Pixar movies have great 3D. They have fantastic 3D. They do. But, but I think people have this idea that James Cameron knows how to do 3D, which he basically does. I mean, I feel like Avatar has good 3D. Avatar 2 has great 3D. But honestly, all of those computer animated films from Pixar and Illuminations and uh, DreamWorks, they all have excellent 3D. Um, our montage, I thought, was excellent 3D. Yeah, absolutely. The montage, you know, our disc had great 3D. So people do kind of like good 3D, you know, and, and a lot of people are willing to do the glasses. I think there's always going to be people who, there's people who they don't see 3D that well, you know what I mean? Like for one whatever reason, their binocular vision isn't super great. That's maybe 10% of the population is never going to be excited about 3D because they their 3D vision, they don't have a lot of depth perception, you know what I mean? Um, there's also going to be people who find the glasses kind of uncomfortable one way or the other. And I don't, people keep saying, oh, eventually there'll be glasses free 3D. Well, we're going to be waiting a long time for that. It's It turns yeah. out to be a very difficult problem. Like you can do like a glasses free display, glasses free display like this big, you know. Like there was a, a phone that did that. Like yeah. A, yeah, there was a yeah. phone that Red made, in fact. <laughs> um, and other phones have done it, but still feels kind of gimmicky you've probably seen like trading cards like baseball cards that are 3d oh, or you know like yeah and that's you know that technology has existed since the 1930s um you know that people have done great things with that but it's still very hard to do on a display so i think we're stuck with glasses for a long time but i think eventually people will make 3d tvs again and it, it'll just go up and down up and down until eventually they settle on a format or, or something that people people really take to. I, 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 I just don't know. I mean, this Almost is the problem there. is that I love yeah. 3D and I right. shoot 3D. I'm surrounded here. I've got multiple 3D viewers just sitting around my desk here. Here's a 3D nice. viewer. Here's another 3D <laughs> viewer. I've got anaglyph glasses just sitting here. Right next to I've you. got behind me in those cabinets, I've got something like 28 3D cameras. I mean, you know, so... I'm not the right person to ask. When I go to the like 3D club meetings, you know, the conversation is like, why don't people like 3D more? And everybody's like, yeah. I know, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, but it's We're like not what the you, right people to ask, you but know. It's also what you guys said, and again, alluding to the disc and its capabilities being able to last forever because the yeah. technology is not really meeting it. You guys are above and beyond it. The funny thing about it being an AV enthusiast, as we've all talked, we tend to buy the technology first, whether it's the, the formats are always after. I remember having. 1080i i made the mistake of buying a projection lcd and then i had the hdvd you guys were there the microsoft attachment to the 360 was my first introduction and i i lost that war i i loved hd dvd they had all the extra they had the the, the flipping the disc um unfortunately a lot of times we're buying atmos and we're buying the extra speakers for things that aren't filmed in that um, do you guys think we will have another format? Will we have something after 4K? Are we almost done with physical media? I mean, what do you guys think quickly about that? I think it's streaming right now. Well, is that a financial look, thing, look a, look a manufacturing at, look at vinyl, thing? Vinyl, right? I mean, and look at Laserdisc. There have been, yeah. there have always been physical formats that were designed for enthusiasts. They'll always be around. It may not be. Like a lot of stuff is going to go to streaming. Streaming is the cash cow, and it's going to be that way for a long time. A lot of people well, don't care enough about quality to want to go, you know, like why do people buy vinyl? Because they're enthusiasts. They want the big format. They want, yeah. you know. I don't think streaming is a cash part. cow, though. I think, you know, all these. We're seeing that with eventually, the strike. Eventually, yeah. they're going to whittle down probably just a couple services again. I think. Yeah. Companies are losing but, a lot but I mean, of money. The bulk on it. of their the bulk of their money is being earned from streaming. Sure, versus from physical, physical media. Discs. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But there still is money in physical discs, and they will continue to make physical discs. And I think there probably will be another format at some point. But it's going to be, you know, it's going to be for enthusiasts. And there's enough enthusiasts. There's enough people who care about quality. You know, they're still there making, is. you know, limited edition Blu-ray sets of like old movies people restoring old movies and stuff like that there's not a lot of money in it but there are people who love movies like you know these formats like kino lorber and uh i don't know there's a variety of companies out there doing you know digging up old movies 
doing all the latest digital uh, remastering and fixing up things and fixing pops and scratches and cleaning up the image and fixing yeah. gate jitter and all this stuff and being beautiful, pristine, where it's like you can now see like my man Godfrey and it looks probably better than it did when it was first released in 1930. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, because now they can clean it up and make it beautiful. And I mean, other than the fact that the print back then was probably struck from the original, you know, interpositive or something like you can now see movies and they look better on your home TV than they probably looked in the theater back when they were released. And that's kind of amazing. That's great. You and know, that's what and, we've all chased as enthusiasts, right, isn't it? Yeah, Just to like, get, the, get that. This um, is what we wanted. This is, but I, I am mean, being more pessimistic. I think we are streaming is probably going to be the dominant thing for a long time. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. what's interesting is for being somebody who loves movies, um, even Apple TV, for instance. I know you guys remember going to your vinyl store, or going to whatever big box store, trying to find the latest Blu ray or DVD or VHS tape. Um, I remember renting as we talked, you're waiting for the newest release and Apple TV movies that I've already purchased. One is Brotherhood of the Wolf, um, a French film. Yeah, and I've I got went that on Laserdisc. <laughs> so I went back and glanced at it and they upgraded it to Dolby Vision. Oh. And, you know, without me paying for it. Yeah. And without me buying, which I know we've all done it, I have many widescreen right. letterbox <laughs> versions do you have? It's just hard to argue, like you said, the convenience. Yeah. Or having how many times have we looked for the disc? So I mean, the downside yeah. of streaming is they can take it away. Yeah, that. And so I was just going to and, and to like that. I'm really yeah. peeved that the latest Ryan Johnson film Glass Onion, like it's available on Netflix. That's great and it looks good on Netflix if your streaming doesn't break down or whatever. But I, because I'm a huge Ryan Johnson fan, I want a disc, right? Yeah. I want a disc. I want something I can hang on to just in case Netflix decides to, I don't know, put it in the vault like Disney used to do, you know, and they'll be like, yeah, we're going to put glass onion in the vault and we'll bring yeah. it back in six years. I'm like, no, I would like a disc and I would want like the highest quality and I want a commentary track and I want the whole nine yards. And I don't, I'm really mad at Netflix for not saying, you know what, some of our content should be on and and Netflix, I will say, has released some stuff on disc. I don't sure, know. Sure, like Stranger they Things, they've them. done it. Yeah, yeah, some some TV shows like Orange is the New Black, you can get that on disc. Well, part of that is because Netflix doesn't own that, right? That's like a Sony show. Yeah. So but for you guys both, I mean, going all the way to the beginning of the conversation, with streaming, you guys knowing these codecs, knowing them intimately, piece by piece, is streaming something that you guys actually are okay? I mean, so I guess you had said you'd like the disc version. That highest quality, you know the nuances involved in that. So, so doing a streaming version been? of our product is very difficult because yeah. every pattern. So, for example, um, I was going to ask, would there be a streaming version, or is that not know, anytime this? soon? Because it's okay. we have other projects we're working on, you know, our okay. day jobs. But for example, every test pattern on the new disc was encoded ninety six times. So I had I came up with a group of settings, and I would encode every pattern ninety six times. And then for each pattern, I would select the encode settings that gave me the best quality. And that, and so it took six months of machine encode time to encode the discs. <laughs> and Stacy basically has, in another room of his house, he has basically a server farm that when he decides to do <laughs> renders, he will queue up like, you know, but that's. But it was an experiment. I mean, this yeah. is the job. We're obsessive about quality. If you get this disc, you expect it to be a reference, right? They don't, yeah. You don't expect us to cut corners. We have yeah. to be able to say we did everything we knew how to do to well, make it. And this perfect. is where we learned each disc. So the so there's a, you're used to bit rates, right? 100 mm -hmm. megabits per second. But under the hood, the encoder uses what's called a QP, a quantization parameter, which is a scale from, let's say, 1 to 54. I don't know, remember what the range is on HEVC. So the lower the QP, the higher the bit rate. So a rate controller will adjust QP up and down to hit your target bit rate. For our test patterns, we ignore that. We just force QP0 or QP1 on every pattern. But it turns out that's not enough. There are other encode settings where on one clip, it'll actually improve the quality if you turn a setting on or off. And so that's why I came up with 96 different sets of basically 96 different encodes for every pattern. And Stacy noticed something that I thought was brilliant. Like, of course, it, it's which is that <laughs> well, most of the time when you're doing a static 
um, test pattern, the common way to do it is you just do an iframe. You do a single frame pattern and you basically have the disk automatically pause. That saves you space and so forth. But he noticed that actually if you encoded it, um, it would actually get slightly higher precision all the way out to the last P frame. So, you know, do you know how MPEG and other formats that compose like a, an iframe is like a complete, it's like a JPEG or something. It's like that frame can be just decoded by itself. And then there's P frames, predictive frames, where it's just the difference between the previous frame and the current one. And that takes up a lot less space, especially on a static pattern where nothing has changed. But the way the thing works is it generates the iframe and it looks at the original and looks at the differences between them and says, oh, there are a few differences. We could compress that and puts those differences in the next P frame. Then it compares it again and says, oh yeah, we still have a few differences. We could compress that in the next P frame. So each P frame is getting a little bit, a tiny bit closer to the actual original. Like it's you're slowly approaching like an asymptote, if I can use math <laughs> terminology, <laughs> like the <that>. actual <laughs> original. And Stacy did a bunch of analysis and figured out that what was the number of frames so, when it started to settle? It eventually settles and it can't get any so better. So anywhere from about two to six frames. So I just on the new disc, every pattern is nine frames long, just to have so extra room. It plays the iframe, eight more P frames, and that is as close to the original as we can possibly get. Well, sometimes B frames as well. So the ideal thing would be to do lossless, but Blu-ray doesn't allow lossless encoding. Right. So, so I just imagine sitting watching streaming with you guys, just hanging back and watching a buffer and be like, oh my God, because <laughs> there's really no control over that. And you guys are down to like the atom with all of this. You must be like, I can't control this at all. <laughs> well, somebody you're asked really this once, it. like, can people see this difference? And it's like, what, uh, <laughs> well, you know, we, I don't even know how to answer that. It's like, <laughs> This is a reference disc, right? Like yeah. whether you can see it or not, I can measure it. You can put yeah. a test equipment on it. Like we're the only people, as far as we know, that when we do a window pattern, you know, window pattern will be like 10%. And what they mean is 10% of, you know, encoded value, right? Well, you only have a limited number of, of levels, right? So you, the, even with 10 bit, it's between 64 and uh, what's this? It's, not 1020. 940. 940, right. 64 and 940. So you do 10% of that, you're actually in between two levels, right? There isn't a specific level that is exactly 10%. Every other test pattern, generator, and disk that we have ever encountered just picks the closest one, just rounds to the nearest value and puts up a window of that solid value, right? So it's a little bit off just by a tiny percentage. And we said that's that's not right. This is supposed to be 10%. Yeah, so we did there <laughs> the two nearest values to end up at exactly 10%. So when someone points a light meter or a stereo photometer or a stereo radiometer, spectro radiometer. Uh, no, yeah. sorry, sorry, not stereo radiometer. That would be a that would be an expensive piece of testing for me. <laughs> sorry, a um, spectro spectro radiometer. Sorry, I'm just thinking about 3D. Um, it measures 10%. And we are the only ones to do that. And it's not like it's the craziest, difficult thing to do, but we had to write our own software to do that. So and we had a competitor who's like, oh, that's not important. It's not important because he can't do it. <laughs> well, I mean, I think what's funny is when I look at also, I have you guys playing on a Panasonic right now. I see 12-bit. I see all these numbers. Will we see 12-bit true 12-bit TVs? I mean, this disc is already ready for that kind of display. So Dolby's original PRM monitor which is a grading monitor, it's an 8-bit panel, but they use spatial and temporal dither to get up to 12-bit. And they actually did there's demonstrations. Always something that's, there's yeah. always something that's not what we want it to be, but go ahead. But like <laughs> the, LG, the LG OLED panels are 10-bit, but mm -hmm. they're gamma into it, so they really need more bits. So but, are we going to see more bits so we can use your well, disk again, to the fullest? So uh, what's the term they use? Um, there's a term they use for the that Dolby uses, but anyways, if you dither temporally and spatially, you can simulate 12-bit, but no okay. one's done that. Okay. Now, for the for the different formats, Dolby Vision, HDR10 Plus, HDR10, is there one that you guys specifically like or prefer? Well, so I like Dolby Vision's tone mapping, and I like their trim pass controls. The only problem with Dolby Vision is the implementation on the consumer side. If you okay. use our disk, you will find several bugs in it. Okay. 
Uh, well, they, each they manufacturer may have, has it differently as well. Conceptually... Well, no, no, no. This is a black box that's in Dolby's algorithms, so oh. no one, can, no one can work around that. Um, but it may not exist for the newer Dolby that's on streaming. I can only test it on Blu-ray because that's where our patterns are at. Because Dolby on Blu-ray is 2.9, they're currently at 4.0 on the streaming devices. Conceptually, Dolby Vision is the most sophisticated, yeah. you know, HDR format. Like they have more controls, they have more. And, you know, they are trusted in the industry because Dolby, the name Dolby means a lot in Hollywood. Like of they've course. been the kings of audio for a long time. They have a lot of great video patents and stuff. The downside like, with Dolby is people don't necessarily like paying royalties. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, same yeah. So Dolby makes their money by charging everybody. And it, it, you know, when you, when you're trying to cost reduce a disc player and you look at the cost of the Dolby royalties, I'm sure that that, factors in people are like that's yeah. a lot you know but that's how Dolby makes their living you know that's how well, they I'm pay sure, for all the scientists and well stuff. i'm sure samsung having the most tv sold probably saved themselves i'm not paying for that yeah right. um you think the discs will be upgraded to four no. is it four really okay no, it's 2.9 so the implementation on streaming is better i mean or... let's it yes. they might be at some point but it's it's not looking great right now just because the disc business is not in great right. shape like everybody's trying to figure out where is it going to be so like, it's transitioning from a mass market format to an enthusiast format and that's a tricky place for the studios well, and for everybody involved they don't really want to invest a lot of money in something that's eventually going to become a niche format so 2.9 is from 2013 and so that tone mapping algorithm from 2013 is still better than what's in all consumer displays today i oh, think okay. He's looking at our content, uh, there's several examples I can give on the disc, but their their algorithm from 2013 outperforms LG's algorithm from 2023. Oh, okay. That's 2.9. mapping on the fly it turns out to be a very yeah. difficult problem. 4.0 yeah. improved the tone mapping, plus 4.0 added additional trim controls. So a trim is basically color grading on the fly. So you 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 grade your master, and then you go through it, say, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, and you fine-tune each shot with these additional settings, and those are applied on the fly during playback. So let's say you have a TV that's 1,500 nits, but you only did a 1,000 and a 2,000 trim pass. Well, then it interpol does linear interpolation between those two trim passes to come up with the 1,500. And it works quite well. It's just bugs on the Blu-ray side of Dolby Vision on the playback uh, have impacted the quality. Like, there's a hidden test pattern on our disc that will tell you if it's working correctly or not. But that said, like I try to watch stuff in Dolby Vision wherever possible. You know, I mean, it's, it, it, <laughs> there are bugs, but it's not like it, you know, it's, it, it doesn't completely destroy the experience. It's just frustrating. It could be better. Well, and know? again, f these bugs may not exist in 4.0. So okay. well, I remember when it was tacked on to certain manufacturers was added via firmware update then that was built into the TV. Um, so let's circle back to the disc. Is there anyone that you want to include in talking about this disc? Anyone you want to talk about that helped well, you make this disc? Other so than who's on the credits? Yeah, there's a lot of people on the credits. A lot of people donated their time. But one of the that's patterns cool. uh, that I think Classy is the only one that's actually really used is the peak luminance yep. pattern. Okay. Like work, uh, and that was actually an algorithm that Dolby had come up with, and then we then took that and put it on the disc. So it has a synthetic background that simulates real-world material when you're making an actual measurement. So um, the UHD Alliance has a test pattern for measuring, measuring peak luminance. They put the window in the center of the screen, then they move it to the right, to the left, and back in the center. This gives the LEDs time to cool down so they can get that peak measurement. But if you actually take one of these consumer TVs that measures a thousand on this test pattern, you'll never see anything above 600 on real content yeah. because you have all this stuff moving. So our test pattern is that particular test pattern. I think it produces a far more accurate peak luminance value. And like I said, Classy's wow. done a good job measuring a bunch of TVs, publishing the graphs. And yeah. so I That's assume you've, wa you've watched his we videos didn't, on that. We didn't actually, oh yeah, I know him. Yep, yep. I, I want to point out for the, for the record, we did not actually get that pattern from Dolby. Dolby came up with the idea. We they, they wrote the algorithm. It. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's but, in a published paper and we referenced the paper in the credits as well. So yeah. excellent. Excellent. Now for the disc, where is the disc purchasable? I know that the last generation was on Amazon. Um, so we currently don't have it on Amazon. Okay. Um, 
one of the reasons is am people treat Amazon as a rental service. They will buy the disc, use it, and then return it, making up really? excuses. And sometimes they don't return the disc. Like I said, sometimes they might return a horseshoe. And Amazon doesn't care. <laughs> Amazon say it's returned. They take the customer side. Plus, Amazon would take about $10 per disc as well as their cut. Wow. Okay. So there's a lot of sellers who aren't happy with Amazon, but they're sort of the okay. only business in town. But if yeah. you go to our website, there are dealers. And Jason, our distributor, you know, has a good relationship with dealers. Okay. We'll make sure we have everything linked below where you guys can purchase the disc. I would recommend buying them both. Buying the original. Well, the the, the original's not available it's... anymore. I mean, it does have some differences. The montage is different. Yep. And there are probably some other ones, but, but all in all. The previous disc is still available with the 3D, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 You should get that one. <laughs> and you should then, have, yeah. then get a 3D television, and then you should also write to every... You buy every 3D <laughs> Blu-ray you can get your hands on. But, like, but using the 3D disc as an example, so the 3D disc is where we introduce our first scaling test pattern. But if you look at that scaling test pattern, then on the first UHD disc, it's changed, and then it's changed again on the latest UHD disc. Basically, we will improve patterns along the way based on customer feedback. So for example, Panasonic added this feature called Edge, which it gets rid of ringing uh, when you scale an image, and it works really well. But then a customer reported that on the movie Captain America, there's some Venetian blinds that get more A in it when you turn on the edge feature. So we added a little segment on our test pattern that shows off that more A. While you guys are on the fly. Also, if you compare the second edition versus the first 4K disc, you'll see our chroma alignment diamonds on there. Mm -hmm. They weren't on the previous one. So when you look at a 4K disc, the chroma alignment diamonds are really small. They're hard to see. So you need a loop, which works really well. So we had this idea, well, what if we make an HD version of the pattern, the display scales it up and it's much easier to read. Well, then we ran into a TV that introduces delay during scaling. So that's yeah. why we add the chroma. We call them diamonds, but we added those to the scaling pattern because of that. Again, we find issues. We update patterns to show the, the chroma issues. diamonds are a perfect example of something where we wanted to put chroma, uh, chroma lumen alignment has some, been something for years that you could really only do with test, test equipment. And, um, on Avia, you know, Guy Quo came up with a chroma luma alignment pattern that was really hard to use because it was like blocks of luma with next to blocks of chroma and the edges were not, you know, chroma has very soft edges. So trying to figure out which one was aligned properly was really hard. But before but that, whole, there was no pattern. So and there I mean, was, you know, yeah. they're trying to do it visually. The idea was it's just impossible. And then at some point, I don't remember when we were brainstorming, this was something that kind of kept coming around. We're like, if we could do a chroma loom alignment pattern, that would be really nice. And at some point, the concept of the diamonds occurred to either me or Stacey. I don't remember. It was Don. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, uh, from that one. <laughs> and so we implemented it and it worked beautifully. Like we took it to displays where we knew they had a chroma lumen alignment problem and it just popped right out it was really yeah. easy to see you could visually see it on the screen we were like hallelujah you know and that that kind of thing is what we live for when we think yeah. here's something that people would like to be able to measure visually but there really isn't any way to do it right now nobody's created a test pattern nobody has a way to do it yeah and then you know, sometimes it just takes a lot of thinking about it, a lot of iterating and just kind of keeping it in the on the back burner. And one or the other of us will come up with a way to do it and we'll and, build it, test it. And it works. You and know, the first one is just, is it, you know, is it symmetrical or not? And then the second iteration of the pattern, you actually have different, you know, half pixel increments horizontally and vertically. So you can actually find the one that's symmetrical and that's the amount of error it has. Yeah. Well, and for, for us recommending TVs, I think what's fascinating is you guys had mentioned you know, Don, you're talking about bringing out those two formats for your friends to compare. People are buying TVs for streaming. And yeah. with this disc and those tests, we're able to see where those TVs may look the same with Netflix or even YouTube, but they will fall apart under stress, meaning high speed gaming, which a lot of PC gamers, you know, Chroma, 4K 120. So having this disc, having that ability to, to stress that does really weed out what TV is good for, you know, your casual streaming, which they're all kind of meeting at the top, yeah. but it does talk about spending that extra money for the processing, which this disc does show how well those companies are almost adapting to what you guys have already done. So yeah. in one of our previous um, interviews we had done with someone when the disc came out, someone had brought up that Apple TVs apparently, it might've been classy, actually it was his video, 
where apparently if you're doing YCBCR out of an Apple TV, some of the levels are wrong. So after that, after that interview, I went back and I actually took our chroma or took our, uh, our monotonicity pattern, which basically has every YCBCR level. And I put it on an Apple TV and I measure it with an analyzer. And sure enough, in SDR, it's off by two code values when you get near black. But it turns out RGB is also wrong, just in a different direction. So oh, damn. <laughs> HDR is correct, but SDR is wrong. So YCBCR wrong, like the guys were saying, but RGB is wrong as well. So I still use YCBCR. So you're like, you basically uncovered it and you're like, oh, then this other thing's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> But again, it's SDR. I try not to watch a lot of SDR. But you know, we were talking about quality in 4K and 8K. What I'm most impressed with these days is the quality of YouTube. Yeah. I mean, the content, like your stuff, it's just YouTube looks fantastic compared yeah. to what broadcast was just a few years ago, where you'd have, you know, police sirens or the police lights and they would break up into macro blocks. Like YouTube looks better than that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I live on being on that on that format and having this interview on that format. Now we're over an hour, which is okay because I actually really want. We got to fit the right time slot on the internet, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, gotta I think... go in like five minutes, but you guys we're, can continue. No, we're 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 about done. Well, but... everything that Stacy says after I leave should not be taken. Anything he says about me—that's <laughs> all lies, lies. Right. I tell you. Well, yeah. Don is so you great. Know, Oops, sorry. These don't get edited down, and that's why I wanted it to be this long. But to not only say thank you, but we again we talk about the authority and what this means and what that means. The filmmakers, the engineers, when I talk to you guys that are the science behind that, it's, it is humbling. And I could talk to you guys for hours um, and we could talk about 3D and formats, but what went into this disc and even this disc is something that everybody should have, um, as you mentioned, not just the newbie. And for me in this influencing game, any YouTuber that watches this, you need to have this disc not just for the calibration side, which I know, as we mentioned, Stacy, um, ISF, and we have a lot of young people coming back into the industry as calibrators, which we all encourage. A lot of the people on this channel are becoming um, calibrators with ISF. So from all of the community, from myself, I want to thank you guys so much. I encourage everybody, as we mentioned, to pick up this disc. Um, it is not expensive for everything that is in it. As both guys have mentioned, it could have been sold as a tool to any studio for a fortune. I think it's actually pretty cheap for what you get. And like the other disc, I would never part with it. But any parting shots before I let you guys go? So um, when you do the B-roll and you talk about authority, I want to hear Cartman. Respect my authority. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's no B-roll. This is what the yeah. best is. Respect my authority. <laughs> this, I, I, as you can tell, I'm not too serious. This is how the interview is going to be. I'll add some stuff, but nothing's getting so, edited out, boys. So the skin tone footage, had we waited one more week, it wouldn't exist today because we shot that on February 29th of 2020. The next week, all the lockdowns went in effect. And so oh, we were wow. lucky to get okay. that. In fact, so uh, the skin tones came up because of someone on the forum said, hey, can you please add skin tones? Actually, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But then even the montage music, someone on the Blu-ray forum said, hey, can you put some new music on there? And so that's when we got the yeah. Atmos music. And so oh, have you heard true. Have you heard it in Atmos? I have, actually. Yep. Because I've yet to yeah, hear I, it in I, Atmos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We have. So, yeah, so much of people's music. perception of video quality is has to do with memory colors. Like, this is a really fascinating topic. Like. Memory colors are colors that we have a whole set of processes in our brain that are just really drawn to those colors. They're like greens, like tree green, tree and grass green, you know, like natural greens, sky and water blue, and skin tones. And the one thing about the montage is there's almost no people in it. So there's very little, very few skin tones. And that's, that's really like the montage has tons and tons of memory colors in it uh greens and and natural blues like the natural world it's like we have special processing that is like oh look there's trees there that means water that means life that means yeah. food you know what i mean and well, the same thing with water and sky and so forth it's just so much around us that if those colors are off you notice right well, one quick note about the montage squirrels don't require release forms so oh, that's, that's, yeah, say, there are no people at all in the montage that's because <laughs> release forms you know release people, forms yeah, yeah. So the, yeah, the in, skin tone footage, we always had to pay the models. Tone, but and, skin right. tones are a, are a memory color, you know. So yeah. it's it's very important to to seeing if if things are off, people notice when skin cones look weird. You know what I well, mean? They also notice when grass looks weird and when sky looks weird. 
But and if it you, is important to have skin to them. Like we have three different Caucasian models, but they all have very different skin. Yeah. And I mean, Absolutely. we could have filmed a million models. There's always going to be something missing. And it was hard, again, yep. due to COVID, it was hard to get the ones that we got. Now, real quick, before I let you guys go, this is always a big subject for TVs. Where are you guys with accuracy as far as TVs? I know the disc is based on that. Do you love a very accurate image? Do you want everything true to life? Do you like some of the processing enabled? Or do you I like the accurate? image. I want to view the image that was intended to be viewed. So I turn off all processing. So by the yeah. director. Yeah. Basically, uh, so if, if the image should be noise reduced or sharpened, it should be done in post by the content creators. Okay. The TV yeah. is just there to reproduce what it was. Okay, Don, same with you. Oh yeah, absolutely. No, I'm I'm looking. If I could see exactly what the director, the cinematographer, the color grader saw, that's what I that's what I'm interested in. But just know like that I, what you see in a movie I'm is not, not reality. I, I don't judge people. Like I think there's two two ways to look at it. It's your TV. It's your discs. It's your enjoyment. Yeah. Like do what you yeah, want to yeah. do. Just don't like like our tools are not for like your eyeballs are good enough to say i love things in torch vision you know if you yeah. if you want to turn it into you know vivid mode and watch everything like hyper saturated and blown out and postery right if it makes you yeah, happy you know it's your life what yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. do what makes you happy i'm not going to i literally i really do not judge but i don't think that that's no. our that's audience. not our audience You're right yeah that was just your my preference let's see what your preference was yeah all right I guys mean, well go ahead no yeah <laughs> don't judge you know like people it's it's but at the same time respect our authority yeah, respect exactly. our authority. <laughs> yeah. like just do as you're told and you yeah, this the right yeah. way <laughs> yeah we're right you're wrong but, you know. <laughs> but that's okay it's okay to be wrong yeah all right gentlemen yeah. well i want to thank you again from myself and everyone watching and again this will be left uncut i will edit it and add a lot of the features we're discussing, but I am very, again, humbled and honored to have you both here. I love the disc. I love the work you do. And um, hopefully more people will see the geniuses. I will say that behind this work. Um, I'm blown away. We could talk all day, but I want to thank you both for coming on today. Well, and hopefully you guys get good use out of it at the shootout. Oh, well, so I was going to say at the shootout will be next week. And that's what, because I'm co-hosting along with our friend, FOMO and uh, that disc will be run for three days. So you will see a ton of it. And also we'll be filming the calibration portion with all the calibrators, which Cecil will be part of it. Uh, Jason will be there and we'll be filming all of that. So we'll be able to show a lot of those patterns and a lot of those calibration tools next week. You know, one of the issues that you guys have, as influencers have is whatever TV you point the camera on and it white balances, that's the one that's going to be biased. So you almost need a camera per TV so that you know oh, the yeah. white balance of, of the camera is not getting influenced by one because otherwise people are going that tv looks green the other one looks good to me oh it's always it's really it's white always balanced on the other one and then it's, the problem I mean, if we do if, tough, if yeah. we do shoot them differently then you're you're hoping the person who's editing it is going to color grade it back the right way and then not make yeah, them look exactly yeah. the, which happens yeah. when they do it exactly the same but basically but guys, evaluating quality you, over but, streaming is, is is a challenge yeah. yeah it's all about context that's why it's yeah. so important to discuss what we see but i want to thank you guys i really really appreciate it Thank you and both thanks for, for having coming us. on. Thank you so much My for pleasure. having us. Great conversation. Yeah. Thanks for being here.